stupidity as a productive mode of thought for creating and researching contemporary performance. This stupid talk this evening will be divided into two stupid parts. In the first stupid part, I will share my dissertation research project, Struck Stupid, 21st Century Performance, and the Limits, or Theatrical Performance, I always forget to say Theatrical Performance, and the Limits of a Discourse. And it will be a largely theoretical, though hopefully still approachable, discussion about stupidity as a concept and how the concept shaped my performance research methodology. In the second stupid part, I will share some details from my own creative practice that relies heavily on stupidity as a generative and creative way of thinking to make original contemporary performance work. The second part may have a bit of overlap with the artist talk that I gave last year on my body of work, but hopefully not too much, and likely most of you weren't there, or you will have forgotten what I said by now anyway. I, I know I have. So, and now stupid part one. When I was a grad student, we had several faculty job searches ongoing. It was a regular practice for the prospective candidates to have a lunch with the grad students, usually pizza. The candidates would undoubtedly ask the grad students to go around the table and introduce themselves in their research focus. My peers would answer, I'm writing about itinerant theater in Scotland and how that shapes a mobile notion of national Scottish identity. I'm writing about feminist Peruvian performance and how theatrical performance performance uses presence to mark the absence of abducted and missing indigenous women. I'm writing about queerness in the archive with a focus on the plays of Charles Bush. All of these great projects, and then I would answer, I don't know, <laughs> the candidates would laugh and then say, no, really, and I'd respond again, I, I don't know. Around the same time in my graduate education, I went to see a performance called Back to the Present by the Berlin Performance Ensemble, Dorky Park, led by the Argentinian choreographer, Costanza Macris. This is the picture that was used to advertise the show. And it had this description. Silent movies, slapstick, horror movies, MTV, reality TV, and the classics of modern dance theater are formed by the choreographer into an independent over, or I'm not sure how to pronounce the French. The enthusiasm of the spectator is transformed directly onto the stage. It sounded like this performance didn't know what it wanted to be or wanted to be everything all at once, and I had to see that for myself. So this is the trailer for that show. Tough way. back to the present, I laughed, I cried, I was mesmerized. I was engaged by this performance in a way that I had up to that point never experienced. And yet, if you ask me, well, what was it about? I could not even begin to tell you. I was literally struck stupid. All I could say was, again, I don't know. In his book, After Method, Mess in Social Science Research, the British sociologist John Law presents the reader with this image and suggests that if this image is not presenting a logical, clear, and coherent meaning, then there is something wrong with approaching it with a methodology that is logical, clear, and coherent. The conventional research method of asking a question, proposing an answer, reading the object or phenomenon to verify or prove that answer seems irrelevant when the object in question is intentionally designed to thwart that process of meaning making and closure of knowledge production. This image is not offering any answers, 
but only presenting an opportunity to the spectator to question not only the meaning of the image, but the entire game of meaning making itself. Back to the Present as a performance event seemed to me to be doing something similar, which means that if I were to approach that performance as a performance scholar or critic, I would need to find a different method than the conventional approach. How could I engage with the performance in all of its mess and not force it into conclusive knowledge, but allow it to leak through processes of thought that resisted coherence? And still do my job as a performance scholar and come up with something better to say than I don't know, which admittedly can feel dismissive and lazy. I will try to show that while yes, answering in the stupid can be dismissive and lazy, that is not necessarily always the case. But first, another note about method and its relation to art. In his book, To Destroy Painting, Louis Marin writes of the painter Caravaggio in his paintings. Marin argues that it is not the job of the art critic to write about the painting, but instead to write of the painting. The art object has done something in the world already. It has announced itself, it has initiated a conversation, and it is not the job of the critic to place their own projected meanings onto that art object but instead to think in accordance, alongside, in relation to, and of the painting. While critics and scholars are most often trying to produce knowledge, that is rarely what a contemporary artist is attempting. Artists are often trying to construct and offer opportunities for experiences. They are choreographing events for spectators. The act of viewing a painting, a sculpture, a dance, or a theatrical performance may generate some parcel of knowledge in the spectator but it may also strike them in a different way where knowledge produced is not the goal. Instead, they are asked to witness, to participate, to experience something. One method to approach an artwork is the hermeneutic. The viewer, or the critic, reads the artwork as a series of symbols to be unlocked and to provide a sort of hidden meaning. In the history of art, this was certainly a useful, useful methodology, especially during the Middle Ages, when works of art were coded forms of worship to an ever-present and vengeful god. In the contemporary moment, however, when God is dead, the idea of authorship is questioned, narrators can't be trusted, universal meaning itself is contested, trying to unlock that one hidden meaning seems antithetical to the way in which contemporary artists work. The contemporary artist is often asking the spe spectator to engage relationally with the artwork, and that relation may result in a meaning of sorts, but if so, it's not the one hidden meaning the artist has somehow embedded in the work, in a secret code that if only you had the secret decoder ring, you could win all the knowledge points and prizes. You get a million points, 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 you get a million points. You figured it out. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> this hermeneutic reading would be what Marin is talking about, writing about the work of art. A heuristic reading, however, would be more in line with writing of the painting or of the contemporary performance. Instead of the one secret meaning to be unlocked within, a heuristic reading spirals out from the encounter with the artwork or performance with the viewer. It is an encounter in an event where thought moves through the interaction of the viewer subject and the art object. This movement of thought that doesn't land in a fixed knowledge product is stupidity. Thought on the move, thought that does not cohere, thought that moves with and of the artwork rather than about it. I have chosen the word stupidity carefully and deliberately but also based on somewhat of an accident or insidious alg algorithmic targeted marketing. Around the same time in grad school that I saw back to the present, I was also struggling to reconcile the pedagogical practices I was being taught with my research practice. As teachers, we were taught not to be a sage on the stage dispensing wisdom to our students, but rather guides on the side, leading them through critical thinking that often turned to more and more complex questions rather than answers. How could I do this in my research practice as well when that didn't seem as encouraged and instead I was expected to make an argument and support it with evidence and prove it and produce knowledge in the form of a lengthy dissertation? I rarely use Amazon anymore, so I'm not sure if this still happens, but I'm actually 100% sure it still happens. But at that time, it would make suggestions for uh, things for you to buy. And I don't know what my search history had been, but Amazon suggested I purchase the cultural and literary theorist Avatar Ronell's book-length study called Stupidity. In this text, Ronell traces the trope of stupidity and the potential of being stupid through Western literary history. I was a poor graduate student who was still going to events on campus, much like this one, where there would often be free food, so I thought, uh, no Amazon, I will not buy this book, but I will go get it from the library. 
I attended two schools for graduate school. I did my master's at Florida State and my PhD at the University of Minnesota. The FSU library was notorious for being a mess, and you only ever had a 50-50 chance of finding the book that turned the analysis stand to a state of stupidity. Anytime the patient seems to land in some sort of knowledge of the self, the therapist should offer another destabilizing question that requires the patient to reconfigure their understanding of their self all over again. This process should be never ending, and in working through this work, the patient can begin to stabilize not their identity, but their relation to a real that is ultimately unknowable. So really quick, this is a really quick explanation of this and a little sloppy, but in Lacanian psychoanalysis, the real is th the world of things, and we live in the world of language grafted over those things. So we can never actually touch the thing because we experience the thing through language always before the thing. So the real is ultimately unknowable. All we can know is our speaking of the thing. Once we say the first word, we've entered language and are now out of the, the real and in the world of language. That's the best I can explain that quickly. Um, my last example of laying out a proposal of the concept that I, that I mean by stupidity comes from the sea. <laughs> Uh, there's an animal known as a sea squirt, and in its juvenile stage, it develops as a larvae, similar to a tadpole. It is, however, closely related to humans in that it has a central nervous system and something like a brain. In the larval stage, the sea squirt moves through water, eating, processing the temperature of the water. It is thinking. It is learning. It is stupid. It is trying to find the place it will spend the remainder of its adult life. Once it finds this place, it anchors itself, head first, into wherever it intends to stay, and it calcifies. And then it ingests its central nervous system. That it, it eats its own brain. It's a know-it-all. Uh, it's fully formed all the knowledge it needs for the remainder of its existence. It's the smartest sea squirt in the waves. It no longer needs its brain when it was thinking and learning, when it was stupid, thought on the move, thought that does not calcify into knowledge, thought that continuously swims and flows and dips and bobs. I had arrived at a concept to shape my methodology around, but now I also needed research sites. And in an attempt to write of the performance work I was interested in, I wanted to be sure to be alongside it as it was being made. So I ethnographically entered the field and contacted some contemporary performance artists to see if I could sit in on their workshop process. I was unable to work alongside Dorky Park, I tried really hard, because they are a European company and they have fully funded arts, and if you we're in the room, Costanza Macris wanted you participating in making the work and not just observing. In the United States, I could offer free labor and that would get me in many rehearsal rooms sweeping the floor. In Europe, I had no specialized skills to offer, so they didn't hire me. Their roster was full. I did manage to convince two US devising ensembles to let me sit with them in their process. And I will talk about uh, one of them now and how I stupidly approached their work to write of it and not about it, even though I just said I'll talk about them, but I tried to write of it, not about it. Uh, I think it is important to note that when I did contact these two groups and gave them the briefest description of my project and mentioned stupidity as a method to approach their work, no one in either group flinched at this. In fact, the reception was more like, oh, stupidity? Yep, that's what we do here. Come on, come hang out with us. Um, so the devising ensemble, and just very quickly, Devising is a process of making performance that doesn't involve having a finished script when you begin. That's the, the devising ensemble whose work and process I will share with you is Every House Has a Door. The main process of Every House Has a Door is variable, but what is consistent is that Lynn Hickson, the director and writer, and Matthew Goulish, the dramaturg and performer, would always then collaborate with some other artist or group of artists. So Lynn plus Matthew plus X equals every house has a door's process. I sat with them as they worked on devising their piece. Let us think of these things always. Let us speak of them never. Sort of a stupid title itself. As long as we are thinking of these things always, our thought continues to move and does not allow itself to cohere into the never spoken words of knowledge. The X who were collaborating with, men, with Lynn and Matthew on this project were Stephen Fine, also from Chicago, and two Croatian artists, Mislav Kaveja and Selma Banish from Zagreb. So this is Selma, this is Mislav, this is Steven, this is Matthew. So it's the four performers and then Lynn as a, the, the director, writer. 
I joined them after they had workshopped the show a couple of, in a couple of residencies in both Zagreb and Chicago. For a week or so in 2010, I sat with them in their final workshop at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago when things had pretty much come together and they knew what the show mostly was and it would receive a first public showing. I was able to ask them about how they had arrived there. One of the first prompts that Lynn had given to the others was in two parts. The first part, she asked the question, at what point does a performance emerge, devise an event out of a non-event that is no longer than three minutes? The second part, construct a dance for the members of the group that is no longer than three minutes and uses an abandoned practice as its source. Lynn and Matthew have long used the idea of abandoned practices in their work. Think of an overhead projector. If I was doing this talk today with old technology, I would have to be moving a bunch of uh, clear transparencies around. I might smudge them and do, I don't know what it says anymore. And now, and so, but, but what are the performance potentials from that now defunct technology? You could also think about um, uh, bowing and curtsying, which is a social uh, choreography that we don't do anymore. But what would it be to make a whole dance out of those, just those two gestures repeated? Um, so in response to this initial prompt, sorry, Stephen wrote a ballad that for lyrics called together several raises, phrases from the U.S. Gold Rush days. Pull in your horns, it's time for us to go now. Get a wiggle on, offish curly wolf, it's time for us to go now. Apple knocker, you're full as a tick, it's time for us to go now. Four flusher, hobble up your lip, it's time for us to go see the elephant. As Stephen's textual, as textual assemblage demonstrates, United States collaborators would draw on their knowledge and history of abandoned practices that are rooted in the geopolitical memory of the US. And similarly, the Croatian collaborators would draw from their knowledge rooted in Eastern Europe. In these early stages of collaboration, they all got stuck at home, like sea squirts who felt they knew all they needed to know. They were calcified in process and unable to generate any interesting performance material. In an interview, Matthew told me, it was a little weird we were forced to play out cultural cliches. After some standing still, secure in their knowledges of their home cultures, something finally clicked. Matthew happened to be reading an essay by Stanley Cavell called On Makaveev on Bergman from the book Themes Out of School. In discussion with the other collaborators, it became clear that they all had a passing knowledge of the work of Swedish filmmaker Igmar Bergman, but none of them really knew that much about him. They were all Bergman stupid. What they found in Bergman and his films was what they called an equidistant third entity. None of them felt they knew all that much about Bergman. They all had a stupid distance to Bergman in equal measure. And by moving through the conceptual and creative space that Bergman opened up for the group, they were able to suddenly drop out of their calcified knowledge positions and back into the swimming and movement of stupidity. And they then started generating work that was more interesting than just this is what it is like in the United States, and this is what it is like in Croatia, and you don't understand the United States, and you don't understand Croatia. They learned of a fascinating story about the Serbian situationist filmmaker Dusan Makaveev, well known for his film Sweet Movie, which features scenes of explicit sex orgies and gorging and vomiting up food. Apparently, Makaveev claimed to have discovered a lost Bergman film. He presented at a conference at Harvard, what this film actually was, I see Bill looking confused. Yes, wait. What this film actually was, was an hour-long montage of moments from 11 of Bergman's other films that Makaveev had edited together into this lost film. At the conference, Makaveev played the semi-plagiarized film and then stood in a cape and woman's bright red cap saying nothing for three minutes as if the new film could speak for itself and needed no further explanation. I'm not going to stand for three minutes, but I felt fun. Uh, Every House Has a Door was unable to find a video recording of this lost Bergman film, but they did find a written outline of it, and they used that written outline to stage what they called the Bergman montage sequence of let us think of these things always, let us speak of them never. For the staged version of the montage, montage, 10 seconds of time passing in the live performance is equal to one minute of the missing Makaveev Bergman film. A lighting designer that they were working with introduced a large spotlight on wheels that the performers would pass 
back and forth as they struck poses and spoke into a microphone during the Bergman montage sequence. This intensely bright light aimed directly at the, perform at the performer's faces gave an effect similar to that of a film close-up, such as Bergman's films are rife with. The light needs to be plugged in to a power source, so it was always bound by its trailing power cord. It became part of the choreography of the performers to whip the cord out of their way and out of the path of the rolling light at the same time they passed the microphone and dealt danced with its attached cable. Once the Bergman montage sequence ended, Stephen stood in a cape and bright red women's cap in silence for three minutes of live performance time, a stand-in for the self-satisfied silent Machiavelli. I realize I'm not giving you a total summary or picture of what this performance was about, but that is hopefully by now clearly not the point. I am trying to offer some detail of how these artists found themselves stuck in a knowledge product about home culture and then unmoored themselves into creative thought by working through the stupid notion of an equidistant third entity. And once they moved into that space of stupidity, the work began to take shape, and other things that, could not, that they could not have known were going to happen, this chord dance of the rolling light and the microphone, stupidly arrived in the performance. And so, how did I write of this performance and not about it? For that, I'd like to take a look at the last couple of pages of my dissertation chapter, dissertation chapter, written of their work. I constructed the chapter as a series of three columns. The column on the left was most often, not always, was uh, most often my, my thoughts. Uh, the column on the right was me trying to describe the performance or their process or quotes by them. The middle was our equidistant third entity space, where somehow we overlap. Um, the columns challenge the reader to engage in a nonlinear way with this nonlinear performance. Does the reader read one column all the way down and then go back and read the next? Does the reader read from left to right? Sometimes, and I, was, uh, I take great pleasure in this, I reverse the movement of thought so it travels right to left rather than left to right in how we're conventionally taught to read. Um, so I'm going to read these last couple pages of this now. Um, stupidity, not an image of thought, but an affective condition of everyday existence. Processes of non-knowledge that we engage with and are subsumed in like water on a continual basis. And I was paraphrasing George Bataille's unfinished uh, system of non-knowledge. Not only does the performance not stop with the fall of the curtain, but as one audience member asked at the MCA showing talkback taken from my ethnographic field notes, noted on June 17th, 2010, typed on December 20th, 2010, and read again today, almost 10 years later, where does theater begin? I've, I have tried to trace some of these beginnings and endings beyond the time of the performance with my turn to ethnography. Placing these moments of start and stop at fixed times is impossible, and yet I've let things emerge and allow me to think through the attempt anyway. They couldn't be experts about the others, and also not about themselves in order to make anything arrive out of the encounter. Only when they acknowledged their own lack of knowledge and committed to stupidity did affective possibilities open up. For the final fragment of the performance, Banish stands center stage. Fine and Kaveja approach and flank her. Fine standing stage left of her speaks first, and smiling gently, he says, Selma, I'm going to leave the theater, and I'm going to yell your name. Then I'm going to come back and want you to tell me whether you heard me or not. Then I'm going to do it again, but from further away and I'm going to keep doing it until you can't hear me anymore. This way, we'll establish where the theater ends, okay? Kaveja then speaks in Croatian, and no translation is provided, but I assume he repeats the same text Fine set spoke, because it begins with Selma and ends with okay. Of course, I don't know that it is the same text for sure. The focus could be on lack of competence, deliberate acts of imprecision, processes of non-knowledge, all stand-ins for stupidity. Extraordinary affects, not special to theater performance, but more of the ordinary. Not quantitatively more, but of a higher intensity. The Every House Has a Door performance stages this link as the performance extends to the worlds outside of the theater and opens up the effective possibilities throughout and beyond. 
Like the actor who doubles up parts but then finds both characters meet in a final denouement, talking about theater and everyday life together apparently demands rapid entrances and exits. But this does not mean that the terms of, but this does not mean that the terms of both mean merely different things or that they are completely disconnected. There is on the contrary, a subtle and interesting relation between their conditions of meaningfulness or perhaps stupid meaninglessness. When Kaveja finishes saying okay, the two men walk up and out of the theater. And this was a pretty large theater and she's standing here, they're both there, they both walk up that side and out the door into the lobby. They yell, Selma! They return and they walk all the way back standing to her and then she nods saying yes I could hear you. Um, the long cross back to her flanks is comical. The audience for the work in progress showing at the MCA chuckled enthusiastically. After Banish confirms that she could hear them, the two men turn and begin the long walk out of the theater again. The air becomes thick as the audience finds themselves listening along with Banish for where the theater ends. Their attention harnessed and intent on listening for the place where the everyday takes over and the theater is left confined. Selma! Again, the two men return to her flanks before asking for confirmation that they could be heard. Banish confirms this and off they go again. The game has been set so that with each exit, the men take the audience strains harder to hear as they imagine the space they are trying to hear across is growing ever greater. And it is after a couple of these returns, and Selma is yelled, the men exit a final time and do not return. Gu Matthew Gulis had quietly left the stage earlier, and all that remains is Banish straining to hear the men yell her name, the audience straining to hear where the theater ends and everyday life begins the theater extending out into the everyday indeterminately. A noise that never comes, but is perpetually moving ever farther out, receding further into untraceable becomings. The line that separates theatrical performance practice from the everyday is ultimately non-knowable, as we think of these things always, speak of them never, on the move. They put this guy, this is a reference to something at the beginning of the thing, but they put this guy here for now, but you see how I bring the thought across from like left, I put this guy there for now. Selma, 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 Selma. As I end this stupid first part of the talk, I hope to share how I have conceptualized stupidity, used it as a method in writing of the performance of Everyday House, every, uh, of every House Has a Door, rather than about it, and how they themselves use stupidity as part of their method in generating their performance work. I will now shift to part two of this stupid talk, which will be much shorter, don't worry. Uh, we're about 10 minutes away from the end, and then I can take some questions. So stupid part two. Come on, baby.
again, my work is devised, as it, and as I mentioned, that means I choose, stupidity is a choice, unlike ignorance, that cannot be helped, I choose to start my process without a completed script. I should note that even in conventional scripted theatrical work, stupidity and creatively making up as you go and embracing the unknown still play a large part and is not necessarily special to devising. The main difference here is that I choose to forego relying on one possible known thing, the finished script at the outset. There is no blueprint. Roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> Back to the future. Uh, the performance that I brought to the Minneapolis Fringe this summer, Swim Team, was originally made in 2019 in Greensboro, North Carolina. The Fringe ver version was largely the same. I had to cut it from an hour and 20 minutes to 55 minutes. I had to use smaller tubs of water because the Fringe was nervous about massive amounts of water on the floor since the space we shared with five, was shared with five or six other performances, all rotating with only 20 minutes to clean up setup. So I get it, but it was really annoying. Um, <laughs> oh, and one of the original performers got COVID four days before our performance. So my amazing partner, Lindsay Wente, learned the role in just three days and did an outstanding job keeping the performance alive as a stand-in for Rachel Walker, and who was one of my original three co-creators, along with Molly Thomas and Brittany Williams. If there is no finished script to start with, where do we begin our stupid sea squirt journey? In the case of Swim Team, and this is different on every piece, but in the case of Swim Team, I was fascinated by a Miranda July story. In the story, the narrator is addressing her ex-boyfriend. She tells of a summer spent in a small town where he assumed she was engaging in all sorts of salacious activities with him away. But what she actually was doing was teaching three senior citizens how to swim. The only thing was that the small town had no public swimming pool and none of them had access to a private swimming pool. So the narrator tells them to come to her house and she sets out four bowls of water on the kitchen floor and they practice swimming with their faces in the bowls of water. One of the lines from the story is, it actually takes a huge amount of upper body strength to swim on land. <laughs> the story ends very sadly, the narrator says, addressing the boyfriend. If I had thought this would be at all interesting to you, I would have told you earlier, and maybe we would still be going out. It's been three hours since I ran into you at the bookstore with the woman in the white coat. What a fabulous white coat. You are obviously completely happy and fulfilled already, even though we only broke up two weeks ago. I wasn't even totally sure we were broken up until I saw you with her. You seem incredibly far away to me, like someone on the other side of a lake, a dot so small that it isn't male or female or young or old, it is just smiling. Who I miss now tonight is Elizabeth, Kelda, and Jack Jack, the three senior citizens. They are dead, of this I can be sure. What a tremendously sad feeling. I must be the saddest swim coach in all of history. I was attracted to this story for the image of people swimming in bowls and the sadness. <laughs> My body of work is as rife with sadness and heartbreak as Ingmar Bergman's films are with close-ups. I began to work with Molly, Brittany, and Rachel by having them read the story and then we would all bring in other texts, videos, images. I work very similarly to Lynn by giving prompts. I will offer some prompts such as, do something unexpected with food, and that it is up to the performer collaborators to propose a response to that prompt. Here, Molly soft boiled some eggs, had them all suck out the yolk, and then Lindsay and Brittany put toothpaste in the eggs and used their fingers to brush their teeth, but Molly ate her toothpaste filled egg so not only is there stupidity, stupidly no script to start, but I only stupidly ask questions and see what arises in the early stage of content generation. What started to present itself was that the three women were sort of performing a heartbreak healing ritual. Was it to heal themselves or the audience or one another? That was never really clear, but the swim team was here to help someone through that heartbreak. So this final image of the show was arrived at by taking a proposal Molly made she came into rehearsal one day, and I have to say Molly's a badass, okay? I don't think it is fair to expect every performer creator to be willing to risk bodily harm and take big risks, but I am that kind of performer creator myself, and I always appreciate it when I get to work with another one. I never expect it or push for it, but when someone presents themselves that way, I certainly am excited. And Molly brought in a proposal where she wrapped her body in green duct tape. 
it stuck some to her actual skin, and it was not pleasant. And as much as I loved this badass body risking proposal, I knew I couldn't ask her to do it again, let alone the other two women. But I was almost as excited by this image of this wrapped body in green tape as I was the bowls of water. There are several references made throughout Swim Team to the Little Mermaid. And the idea that emerged was a reclaiming of the magic of the mythical creature in her own right, not needing any validation through a relationship with man, with a man, or legs. This seemed also to align with what the narrator was trying to convey in the Miranda July story. I don't need you. I had my swim team swimming in bowls. So Molly, Brittany, and Rachel, and later Lindsay, become a sort of three-bodied mermaid at the end. That's what this is. Using um, non-stick tape for bandaging horse injuries. And in that way, there's also a very subtle reference to the idea of a centaur. N no one would ever get that, but another half-human, half-animal body. Um, and they would wrap themselves into one stronger together mythical being, ready to move through the space of heartbreak to some sort of healing. I had no idea this would be in this performance when it began. I knew about the story, I knew the name Swim Team, and then the four of us working together through a series of prompts and proposals stupidly stumbled into some sort of near coherence. We swam as larvae for as long as we could and only calcified into the knowledge of what the performance was as we prepared to show it to an audience. But as these audience reviews from the fringe version can attest, even our known finished product was able to generate stupid responses from the audience who were either delighted or irritated by the stupidity of it all. <laughs> Swim team takes their source material and pulls it apart in every direction. The crew created a truly fringe-worthy show that defies typical theatrical narrative. You will never be able to predict what happens next as the pieces cycle between poignant, funny, and the absurd. I watched the video trailer and I didn't understand the show. I watched their preview and I didn't understand the show. I watched the show and I'm still mystified. I'm impressed that young artists created a work of such lapidary impenetrability. I think that it's all an absurdist joke on old fogies like me, but it was performed with such winsome sincerity that I'm willing to play along. Fringiest thing I've seen in years and its own way, epic. And then the irritated ones. <laughs> A little too abstract, a little too much unstructured for my tastes. Not my favorite. I was excited for this show based off of the description. However, I waited the entire show for it to come together, and it just didn't. I can tell a lot of thought and creativity went into this show but by the creators and performers, but as an audience member, I couldn't tell you what it was about. I, when I make work, I could never predict what any single one of you would like. So I don't care. I make... <laughs> I make what I make based on this stupid process, and if you like it, cool. I, it's not that I don't want you to like it. If you like it, cool. If you don't, we're okay also. It takes work to be stupid. It can also be lazy and dismissive to be stupid. Stupidity is a choice. It is uncomfortable. It can also be thrilling. It is that swimming and bobbing through waters that offer promise. It is thought always on the move. Pizza? I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> and, and whatever time we have, maybe five-ish minutes if you have any questions, and normally they say, there's no stupid questions. I absolutely want your stupid questions. <laughs> hey. So it seems like that last comment was actually what you'd be after, if I, if I get the gist of your talk right. You want it to be in kind of it not make sense. It's right. It's not about something. It's an experience thing. Right. So like th that they have to be willing to engage. The, the, the comment about it, lapidary, whatever, says I decided to play along. And that's what I'd ask the audience to do, to not worry about, I don't get it. It's, it's fine. Just be here and witness this and have this experience. But not, yeah. yeah. You don't have to get everything. No, no. McManus? It still follows the same procedure of spoken language in that there's a thing that is referred to by this other sign. Okay. It's just a, a perform. It's a gesture rather than a language or a text. It's a it's a gesture rather than a text. Okay. But it still follows the same format. Of there's a thing over there, 
and I make a symbol to represent that thing. I don't know sign language. I'm not pretending to do it. But that, but that there, there's still it, it follows that same procedure. So it, it's not any closer to that Lacanian like real. It's still the representation. Okay. It's still using the stand-in of the, the gestured word instead of the text. Typically, the person who comes up is John Cage yeah. in talking about this. <laughs> right. It would be similar to looking at like that same tension between what is music and what is sound of every day. So, but I don't minimalist where it's this constant like, like with like who would you who, who would be an example? Uh, Steve Reich. Okay. Yeah. So like Steve Reich has done um, like he'll he'll play two of the exact same tracks. It doesn't have to be music. It can be words or whatever. And one will be like five beats per minute faster, and then for like 15 minutes, you just listen to the bass completely out and then get back together. Yeah. And it brings up also really interesting reactions from audience members where some of the audience is like, what the hell was that? I hated that. I, I can't, like, they'll leave, you know? Yeah. But then other people are like, oh, oh my god, like, this is it, you know? Right, well, not, like, any music that's even, it's not in 4-4 right now, like, a contemporary mm -hmm. year has a hard time dealing with, right? But, like, what what are the other potentials of something that's not easy? The other the other thing is like I you know, yeah when you come to see something I expect you to work that music is asking the listener to work like it's not just being handed to you right I haven't but we can talk yeah. <laughs> other questions Bill you got the last one. I mean, I know that it's, rich, right? it's incredibly fascinating to me. I, I have been thinking about, there's one piece I've made that did have a very, very loose narrative through it, which was then, narrative to me is telling the, you know, you have the story to follow, there, it's less stupid because there's a through line to follow. And, and I'm thinking about the next piece I'm making, having again a little bit of narrative and maybe more text. So, I don't know. <laughs> I, I go by whatever strikes me and fascinates me. But the stupidity was the, yeah. Also, it's like, well, are you just talking about thinking? Yeah, that's, that's enough. <laughs> like, just, 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 just thinking all the time and not always re, uh, uh, rethinking the thing. Um, that's, that's, that's time. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of here. Go see stupid ghosts. We're going. We are. Oh, he's both. I got voted today. It's very exciting. Yes. Go, <laughs> Bob. Oh, it felt so good to vote against her. <laughs> George, can we talk about visual stupidity sometime, too? Sure. My pizza was.